Williams. This is the 30th anniversary of the beginning of the Elgin County Pioneer Museum. Mrs. Young, the former chairman, and myself are doing some reminiscing, and we'd like to thank Mrs. Young for her memories. We're looking at scrapbook number one of the Elgin Pioneer Mu County Pioneer Museum. Well, Mrs. Fletcher, she was a past pre FWIO president of the Women's Institute, as well as local. She got thinking that we should have something to remind us of the history of Elgin County. So in 1954, she visited the what we call district annuals to see their mm -hmm. feeling, and they take it back to branches. Well, then she just, Mrs. Stanley Lyle was a representative, and Mrs. Fletcher and myself, we visited every branch at that time. There was over mm -hmm. 30 branches in the county to see if they would give us support to the museum, which they said they, they would. Mm -hmm. Well, then, the, she called another meeting and, and to, to tell them the results. And Dr. J.D. Curtis was a, a very notable doctor in Elgin County. He was most interested in, in the museum. And different places came up to, to where we should have a museum. Well, then Mr. Bram Sable owned this building, as well as his residence, and he had a little mm -hmm. business. He approached and said that he would sell the, the house for a museum and the price was ten thousand dollars well there was no funds whatsoever no. <laughs> let alone have the ten thousand yeah. dollars so anyway they had to decide about having a fundraising and mr don anderson of anderson lemon was very much interested to see a museum started in this mm -hmm. locality he offered his store so the Women's Institute of Elton County put on a week of teas. We had different uh, groups do each day, and uh, they brought some of their antiques and one thing or another for display. And we realized $400 from the tea. And that was the down payment of the house. Mrs. Butcher then signed the lease that we would own the house. And then the, who should be the owner well, we consulted with the government, the ministry, and they told us we could go two ways. We could have a charter, or we could get a municipality to, to own us. So they opt out for the municipality ownership. So we went ahead and raised the money. We wrote letters, many letters, all over the, the country to raise the funds, and the Women's Institute canvassed all the rural areas for the funds. and this, being a rural organization, we felt we should get another local organization interested. Well, the IOD, their ideas were along the same as the Women's Institute, so we asked them to canvas the city, which they were, which they were happy to do, and they did do. So that when we had the ten thousand dollars, well, a little more <laughs> raised, we decided to approach the county and the city, just about the ownership. Well, I'd, we went many times, and they were all a little bit skeptical <laughs> to start a new project. But however, finally, the county of Elgin said they would accept the ownership. And, and for the maintenance, the, the government said they would give us $500 a year for maintenance. Well, the county said they would cover $500. Well, the city of St. Thomas, they said they would come up to $500, but not actually in cash. So at that time, they gave us $200 cash, and they said they would maintain the grounds. And mm -hmm. from then on, from right on now, the city still maintains the ground along with their mm -hmm. their cash money. So that yeah. was the way we raised our I funds. Got the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're still raising funds. Every year we have some special fund raising, and, sure. and it has brought the IOD and the Women's Institute very close to one another, and we always mm -hmm. work as a cooperative. That'd be things like the Strawberry Social. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's mm -hmm. a project for the last few years, the Strawberry Social in June. Mm -hmm. We hope to make it more. So this mm -hmm. year being the 30th anniversary. Yeah. There's another article in the scrapbook here about uh, raising the funds for the canvas and one thing another. Well, Dr. Curtis decided that to that should do something about the medical men of Elton County. So he had a committee, well, Dr. Crane and he, this committee, and they canvassed all the living doctors at the time and got mm -hmm. histories of the ones that had passed away. And they published a book on the doctors of Elton oh, yeah, County. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, the funds from the book went to the museum. And this desk came from Dr. Mm -hmm. Sanderson. He was a, a doctor at Sparta, Ontario. So most of the furniture in this room came from Elton County doctors. Yeah. Some of the equipment around here is yeah. Dr. Uh, Curtis's first equipment. Mm -hmm. And then this was, at one time, a medical center, Dr. Duncan and Dr. Oh, yeah. Roth. Oh, yeah. And so that made it, this museum unique that we should mm -hmm. have a doctor's room. Mm -hmm. I see we also have a window here from the uh, first hospital in St. Thomas, the right. uh, Amasa Wood Hospital. Mm -hmm. And another window here from Dr. Corliss's surgery. They were down and the east end of Tall Street, and, and uh, it was a husband and wife set oh. up. And Dr. Corliss was the first woman doctor in this area. Oh, I see. Oh, she was yeah. married. And, I think 40 years old when she decided to go to medical school in, oh. in, at Kingston. Oh, and this is where they held their office. It's down at the east end of town oh, now. And when the, the new owners took over the building, they thought we should have this win window yeah, nice for the museum. Mm -hmm. This revolving bookcase came from another doctor, I understand. And then we have a herb press here, I see, and an old mortar and, mortar and pestle. Doctor shoes. And, mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for sharing your memories with us. About happy. The beginning. I'm happy to do it. Yeah. Okay. The St. Thomas chapters of the IODE were requested to join the project. Mrs. Jean Hoskins, IODE president, will tell about the involvement of the IODE. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Um, Mrs. Fletcher, who was the instigator of the museum, I asked the uh, president of the IODE, she was called a regent then, her name was Irene Anthony, to uh, have the IODE canvass the city because the uh, Women's Institute couldn't come into the city to canvass. So Mrs. Um, Anthony agreed and uh, dispersed the members of IOD throughout the city to canvass and they raised $5,500, which was uh, over half of the cost of the building. And then on the day of the uh, presentation, Mrs. Um, Anthony uh, made a little speech and she said, as regent of the municipal chapter, IOD, it is with a great deal of pleasure that uh, and pride that I'm able to announce the members have endorsed this very worthy project, both from an educational and a civic standpoint, and that they are so convinced of its worth that they are undertaking a canvas of the city on its behalf. And the IOD is still working at the museum. Each, twice each year, we uh, participate in the tea and in the coffee break. Now, the tea is um, something that's now held outside, which is very nice. And in um, the coffee break, where each of the chapters in IOD, and we have five chapters, have a room and they lay out their display of cookies or robes or crafts, whatever, and the proceeds are given to the museum. So we see we, each year we do still support the museum, as, uh, plus we buy our memberships in the uh, museum. Well, good afternoon, Mrs. Vickerson. We're glad that you were able to come today. We're talking about how the museum got started, and I believe you can tell us about the carpet in this room. Well, this afternoon we're uh, in the parlor of the museum and uh, as you're looking around the room you can see many interesting things that have been donated from people in the community. Mainly what we would like to talk about is the carpet on the floor and some of the Women's Institute ladies thought this would be something that they could work together and do. So they sent an appeal out to the community. Uh, to save your old woolen rags. And ladies in the community cut their rags into about one inch strips. And these rags were sewn together on a loom, uh, put together to make the rug that you see here on the floor today. It uh, took about 70 pounds of rags to uh, make the carpet that you see on the floor here in the museum parlor. And uh, 
a great deal of credit it has to go to one of the ladies that you would see here in our scrapbook, Mrs. Reed Dodson. And she is working on the loom, putting some of the um, woolen pieces together. And later on, you will be uh, showing the loom that this was done on out in the agriculture building. And that was just one of the many ways that the ladies in the community took part in our museum. And it is a pleasure to be here this afternoon, and I hope you've all enjoyed seeing our museum parlor. Discussing how the museum site has grown over the year, years, I believe originally it was just what we call now the historic house, the old Duncombe home at the front. Maybe you could tell us how it's grown. Well, I think by 1962 it was very apparent that we had outgrown our quarters and we were going to have to do something about annex. And by the year 1963, we had completed that annex. Not to stop uh, there, we were looking for new ways to make the museum interesting to the community. And through the kind generosity of um, Mr. William Pierce in 1968, the original bee house was donated and placed in the backyard of the museum. Unfortunately, in the year of 78, vandals chose to destroy the bee house. And uh, this created, you know, very much sadness in the community. I don't think they realized that what they were destroy, destroying was of historical value. Uh, through um, Parkside Collegiate and their students, Mr. Robert Havrell decided that they should rebuild the bee house. And uh, I think at this time we're going to ask him if he would describe more about the bee house to us and what they went through to rebuild it. Mr. Haverl, it's nice to have you here and uh, have someone that can explain to us a little bit about the beehive and what uh, you as a teacher at Parkside and your students undertook to achieve. And uh, perhaps you can go ahead and explain to us what you went through and some of the problems that you encountered in rebuilding the beehive. Yes, I think first of all, I think very few people realize how many problems we did go through. Uh, one of the first things that we have to think about is that the only th part of the original bee house is the doorknob itself. There was nothing else left but ashes. Uh, we didn't even, we weren't even able to get the hinges from the door. I think somebody else got those. But um, we had problems. We had to go all the way around the county to start with to get the barn board. Uh, you've got to realize also that uh, when we take down an old building, there is no way that all of it is going to be able to use it in that bee house because when you first put up barns, most of them, <coughs> the boards, pardon me, <coughs> the barns in that, boards in that barn are about one inch thick. Now most of the materials that we recovered, by the time we recovered it, it was about half an inch or five eighths of an inch thick, and it was just too thin for that for that building. Eh? Um, some of the parts, uh, some of the people that did help us, one of the names that hasn't been mentioned, Mr. Gord Thomas, was the fellow that was instrumental in getting this started. Now, Gord Thomas has since died. He was the technical director of Parkside at that time. Uh, he did a lot of the, the legwork because he walked or drove all around this county trying to find barns that we might be able to take down. Now, one of the barns that we took down, we uh, we took the whole class out to uh, the Burgess barn just on, on the Sparta Union Road and we tore it all down. But the problem being, once we got the material back to the school, we found even it was not suitable. We had just a few boards out of it. This is the type of problems that we ran into. Um, had we started with new material, I, there would have been no problems with the, with the building at all. It could have been done in a very short length of time. Uh, the other thing I think that very few people realize is that Probably we were lucky if we could get um, 20 minutes a day on that building, and for this reason, that's why it took longer than what we had figured it was going to. Um, one of the uh, things that is slightly authentic about the building too are the shingles on the roof. Now the shingles were uh, built or cut by the Kettle Creek Authority. Now they 
at that particular time were given a uh, an antique saw for sawing shingles. And they went into the bush and they simply cut down the trees, uh, cut the logs into 18 inch pieces and then went ahead and cut the shingles. So the shingles on the roof are about as authentic as we could get, which I thought was quite good at that, that particular time. Um, the uh, Gothic windows, we had a lot of fun with those, trying to get the shapes of them. Uh, I think uh, also a lot of people don't realize that the, we n at no time ever got to look at any more than two sides of that building because that's all we had in a photograph. Now, uh, it's fine to try to come up with a building, but it's very difficult trying to get the exact details of it. Now, uh, most of the photographs, you notice that the little gable that's on the back, I suppose it gave us about as much problem as any because uh, one of the problems was trying to figure out just how high it was going to be. I think um, that gable itself, I imagine that we started that about three times and took it apart again. So uh, it wasn't just a matter of, build, uh, of building a building. Um, one of the people also that uh, helped us a lot was um, uh, Mr. Marshall Field, who was with the with um, Pinafore Park at that time. Uh, he provided us with quite a few of the boards that went into it. But um, we have some. Uh, we even had some of the old-fashioned cut nails that were donated for the building. We used a few of them, but it was pretty difficult using cut nails in that building when um, the boards were so old that they would simply split as soon as you try to put a nail into the main. So we ended up using a lot of modern finish nails on it. Um, I suppose that's pretty well about it. Uh, uh, needless to say, uh, we did enjoy uh, putting it together. Uh, one of the fellows that I forgot to mention, uh, Mr. Vic Henstock, uh, he was the gentleman that drew the plans up from the postcard once again and from the photos, and he was on staff at Parkside at that time. He's presently on, on staff at Arthur Bowden. He's retiring this year. I know that uh, uh, he was quite happy with the work that he had to do on it, too. Eh? But uh, we had a lot of people involved in it, and as soon as I start mentioning names, I'm sure that I'm going to leave a few of them out. Yeah. So you can't mention too many. This, this gets to be a problem. But I was rather surprised because um, I mentioned um, the museum and one of my students as of just yesterday, he was one of my, he's one of my senior students now, and right off, uh, he says, oh, I worked on that bee house. So I think there's a lot of students actually in Elgin that did have a hand in that, and I think they all quite enjoyed doing it. And like to come and look at it with pride. Oh, I think so. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that they'll probably have their children here and grandchildren here, we hope, <laughs> to walk up and say, I had a hand in that bee house. Mm -hmm. But um, we were very pleased with it. I think it's uh, a very, very close uh, replica of the original bee house. I think also, uh, looking in the articles, uh, they said that there was only two in Ontario at that time. and. But I think uh, Dr. Moorhouse ended up uh, doing some checking into this. He said that the second was a, was a very poor uh, quality bee house, that this one really was far superior to the other one. So actually, we have something quite unique. Um, I think mainly uh, um, we did enjoy doing it. It was a lot of work, but I, I think we, we had a tremendous amount of satisfaction out of it. And uh, I think we'll have satisfaction for a long time. For a long time to come. I would think so. Yes. And the museum thanks you for putting it back together so that everyone can enjoy seeing it. And well, we also thank you for coming and telling us about it. Well, uh, just one last word. Uh, this is one of the things that spurred us on was the fact that we did appreciate the fact that the ladies were extremely interested in having it done. And this is one of the things that did spur us on. Mm -hmm. So we do thank you for coming. Thank you. In 1972, we were very fortunate to have another building added to our premises, and this is a photograph of our agricultural building. In our agriculture building, we house uh, a lot of railroad memories, uh, agricultural uh, implements used in the county, and many things that are of interest in this area are housed in there. If you note, of interest, in 1975, IODE once again uh, decided perhaps they should do something for the museum, and the rose garden that you see in front of the agriculture building in 1975 were placed there by IODE. These roses are uh, not just decoration. Um, they're also used throughout the museum for some of the uh, functions that they um, 
have inside. And so, um, once again, uh, we're very fortunate to have IODE and the Women's Institute uh, in the area, always thinking what they can contribute to the museum. Uh, we're, we're talking now about how the museum was furnished. Some things were purchased and some were donated from families and some were personal things and other organizations. Mrs. Blewett is going to tell us now about how the dining room was furnished. Well, in 1955, the North Yarmouth uh, WI celebrated their 25th anniversary and they published a cookbook that year and the proceeds from the cookbook, which amounted to over $500, was spent in renovating this room. They uh, started with the floor and went right to the ceiling. And some of the lovely things that they purchased at that time was this beautiful sideboard over here and this um, china cabinet. They were bought from the Wadland family. $50 for this and $30 for this one. This overhanging lamp was donated by Mrs. Ralph Hayden and Mrs. Roy Baker, they are charter members, or Mrs. Baker has gone, but they, they were charter members of our institute. This um, lovely tea service here was donated by the Barrett Davidson um, family. He was a prominent lawyer in St. Thomas at that time. These drapes are, the design is uh, uh, known as the, um, Grandma Moses uh, design, and uh, we take pride in this room as um, our ladies have done a lot of work in renovating it. Uh, we've been discussing how the museum got started 30 years ago here, and uh, one artifact we have at the museum is a, is a founder's book, which contains the names of all the people who uh, contributed either financially or through volunteer labor to the startup of the museum. Uh, Mrs. Doris McNaughton is with me now, and she's the city representative on the board, and she'd like to tell us about some of the present activities. We've had an active past, and we wish to remain so. As a result, a number of activities and programs has been developed. Um, public events throughout the year invite people to visit the museum on an ongoing basis. Children stay at the museum, uh, Heritage Craft Day and the Strawberry Social. As well, we have educational programs for both adults and children. In March, a discussion series called Interesting Topics is held and community residents can bring their crafts, collections, hobbies um, to discuss and or demonstrate their skills. This past March, uh, those who uh, participated in this program were treated to discussions and demonstrations on dolls, glass, sewing machines, and um, quilting. Yeah. And anyone is welcome to attend these. Mm -hmm. One of the programs we're particularly pleased with is exploratory visits for preschool children. Very young children are exposed to the museum and they see how people lived in the past in Elgin County. and. Uh, we were one of the, we were the first museum in this area to have given this um, program. It's particularly exciting right now because these same children are revisiting with their kindergarten and grade one classes and it's surprising how much they remember. We feel this is a most worthwhile program. Mm -hmm. As you know, Don, the uh, community museums um, operate under the Ministry of Citizenship and Culture. And um, this organization has defined six areas of operation to which we must strive to achieve. Uh, these are uh, research, collection records, management, staff training, interpretation and exhibition, education, and conservation. Yes, that's right. Uh, the Ministry of Citizenship and Culture also requested that museums have a statement of purpose. Uh, this statement explains why the museum exists. The Elgin County Pioneer Museum was established to acquire, preserve, research, exhibit, and interpret artifacts relative to the history and development of the County of Elgin and the City of St. Thomas. This is why the museum was established 30 years ago and why it's still in operation today. Uh, 
It would be especially fitting to close with a quote from Mrs. Dorothy Futcher, who was the first uh, organizer of the museum. In 1956, Mrs. Futcher was asked, who will this museum belong to? She replied, there is only one answer to this question. This will be your museum. It will belong to the citizens of Algon County. Mm -hmm.